Tennessee's Wild Side, broadcast for nearly two decades, was originally created through a vision of the Jackson Foundation. The Foundation remains a supportive partner in the mission to educate viewers about wildlife, natural resources, and opportunities for outdoor adventure. Hi friends, welcome to the Wild Side. I'm Ezekiel Hall, filling in for our host who's on assignment. All access adventures are often something we offer you here on our show. And when we were on location for World Wetlands Day, we found out that rangers were working on a prescribed burn of over 80 acres in Radnor Lake State Park and Natural Area. A week after the big February freeze of 2021, we went behind the barricades for an exclusive environmental experience. If a tiny spark can start a forest fire, a drip torch and a lighter can certainly set fields of thatch ablaze. The type of fire we're doing today is just gonna burn on the ground. It's gonna be pretty low impact. It's not gonna be really hot fire, but it'll clear out all this grass and stuff that's dead and dry on the ground. Four main areas are designated burn targets, but this is a test fire to see if the forecasted conditions will sustain the overall strategy. It's all about the conditions out here. So we wanted it wet, but not too wet, and a little windy, but not too windy. And I think today is, is a kind of a perfect burn day. You want to see kind of all uh, fire behavior aspects during your test fire so you can see what's going, what works well, what doesn't work well. A slow and steady fire, encouraged by the wind, quickly picks up speed. So with the wind direction, it uh, kind of lit a little bit of a head fire, so we we're going to try to cut it off because that's not what the prescription called for. It got a little hot, so we stepped back. We're going to let it um, hit a different fuel type that will slow it down and allow us to get ahead of it and put it out with hand tools without having to put our tractor plow on into the ground. The training each member has undertaken to be a force on the firing line institutes a level of respect and trust that everyone will do what needs to be done. With fire involved, there's always a little bit of danger. Um, we do our best to mitigate that. So we've got fire lines around everything we're gonna burn today. All units, please stand by for the 1300 fire weather. We have winds out of the north at four and a half miles per hour, gusts up to seven and a half. That is an increase of 0.2 miles per hour. Temperature is 60.7 degrees Fahrenheit. That is an increase of one degree. Relative humidity is 40.6%. That is an increase of 1%. If the wind conditions go out of control, we'll stop the burn. We won't burn anymore. The test fire field high on a hill dried out in the early morning sun, making it the ideal location. Even so, the battle lines are drawn so the fire can only come this far. If you look down, uh, we have a uh, established plow line throughout uh, surrounding the whole burn unit um, down to bare mineral soil. Bare mineral soil doesn't burn and uh, we have it at a width that nothing should spot across. To the untrained eye, it would seem trees are vulnerable as the fire rapidly spreads across the natural area. There's no ladder fuels. Uh, ladder fuels would be vines that grow from the, you know, from the ground all the way to the canopy of the tree. Uh, it needs a way to climb up. Uh, bark doesn't just burn as quick as grass because it requires longer time to dry out. Um, we call this a uh, time fuel lag. I believe there's one hour fuels, 10 hour fuels, 100 hour fuels. Um, grass is a one hour fuel, it means that it takes uh, one hour under ideal conditions to dry out to the point where it will burn. Whereas a tree is probably, you know, depending on the diameter, a hundred hour, thousand or ten thousand hour fuel. So it just takes that much longer to dry out. We also have a lot of fire adapted species here. So when you think about oak trees, they have a very thick bark and that bark kind of insulates them from these low intensity ground fires and, and protects that inner living tissue. Uh, some species have a much thinner bark, red cedar, red maple, that, that are more fire susceptible. And, and the, the reason we're okay with that is because those are the species that are less desirable for a site like this. They're native trees and they're not bad species, uh, but it's not the structure and the habitat that we're looking for at this site. So the Native Grasslands Initiative, we started that in 2013 and it is uh, us converting areas that used to be fields historically. Uh, this whole farm was a farm with cattle on it up to the 1970s. In 1979, 
Uh, it was acquired as part of the natural area, 139 acres. And those previous field areas were allowed to grow up. We're restoring them back to field, to grasslands. So um, pollinators, uh, bees and other things, hummingbirds, all those will benefit from this process. Usually what we're doing with prescribed burn these days is trying to recreate um, a, a historical fire regime of the past. So whether it was lightning ignited or ignited by native peoples uh, in the past, or even European settlers used to burn burn land to manipulate ecosystems. Uh, and so we are trying to bring that uh, disturbance back to this area. If you're not fairly familiar with prescribed burning, this all looks quite devastating. But the beauty of it will show up in a couple of months, and then it will just all make sense. You'll start to see green re-sprouts, and with this thatch out of the way, we should get some nice uh, spring wildflowers, followed by some bunch grass growth, like a little blue stem. Uh, and then the end state for this, uh, it'll be planted with a pollinator seed mix. Uh, and our goal here is to provide a lot of quality habitat for uh, pollinators, especially monarch butterflies. We look at it as rolling out the red carpet. We're just trying to make it ideal conditions and sustainable, long-term habitat. As the fires prep the fields for planting, there is an overriding realization that this is all being done in the middle of a metropolitan city. I, I can't hear it back here. Let's wait till it shows up at the park. And they have the number for the park, so we'll figure it out. There's a lot more considerations, a lot more interest if um, someone sees the smoke and gets interested in it. Um, I understand Steve Ward had a uh, telephone conversation with the state fire marshal this morning. I've never talked to a state fire marshal with any of my prescribed burns because it doesn't take place in these heavy, heavily populated areas. This was the largest block that we just burned and everything went like we planned. We, we used our two teams to burn the two flanks and anchored into a nice asphalt road that worked as a fire break. Uh, and we let our two, two flanks run together and filled in the middle grassland area. Um, so it, this went really well today. The stuff that's already burnt doesn't burn again. So once it backs off line enough, we feel confident that we have enough distance between what's actively burning and the, un, uh, the next burn unit that's not scheduled to burn today, we'll back off and go to the next one. Uh, it's supposed to rain tonight, so we're not really worried about any heat overnight. Uh, and, and I believe it's supposed to rain for about the next week, so we're not worried at all about it. If there are any worries at Radnor, they are only for the future. But great leadership comes with having a plan, and those working on this one are able to cast their cares onto the shoulders of their accomplishments. What we're looking at is if we don't make these kind of resource management priorities, you got generations down the line that aren't going to see those butterflies or those types of birds. And we think we can change that. We think we're part of the answer, and we want to be part of the solution to that. At Radnor State Park and Natural Area, I'm Annette Noel Hall on the Wild Side. Tennessee's Wild Side has been a presentation of the Jackson Foundation in association with Rockwater TV.